Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Martin. Welcome to another Casio Artist Spotlight joining you live. We have a very special guest today. But first, I want to welcome my co-host for these episodes, greeting me from 820 miles to my east, Mr. Rich Formidoni. How are you doing today, Rich? I'm doing okay, Mike. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. As always, hope you're all safe and healthy and being musical. Awesome. Well, we have an incredible guest today. She's a prolific singer-songwriter, guitarist, pianist, whose music of merges elements of folk, rock, pop, often with poignant lyrics and complex harmonies. Her songs have been used in countless TV shows, movies, and she's released 12 solo albums, eight of which are on her own record label. Everybody welcome Miss Jonathan Brook. Hi. Hey, Hi. Jonathan. Well, that whole list of things, I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. I had to read well, thank it. You. <laughs> it's very stressful to get all of that out. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we appreciate you setting up the camera and, and reconfiguring some things to, uh, to, uh, to, to share your life with us a little bit today. Come on in my kitchen. <laughs> um, to start with, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your musical upbringing from when you were young? Well, I took piano lessons for about a year, I think, when I was nine, and it didn't go well. Uh, <laughs> I, it, I had a teacher named Richard Merrick, and he, the first, it was in England, I was living in England, and um, the first thing he made me learn was Fur Elise, but he called it Furry Alice. <laughs> and I just like thinking back, I just keep thinking like I was always afraid of him and I I couldn't learn to read music. I was so, I would always rely on my ear. So the notes still, even now, you know, a million years later, I, I see notes on a page and I panic and I freak out and I think of furry Alice and I, and I, <laughs> it's just not a good thing. So I, I play by ear. And then when I was um, 13, I got a guitar for Christmas, and that was the sort of opening of the horizon of like, oh, here's a here's a new thing, and I can I don't have to know how this works either. I can just kind of learn stuff by ear. And then in college, I started writing songs, and that was the real the real sort of being struck by lightning. And that's when I started experimenting with open tunings. And um, the the first song that I the first tuning that I made up was trying to figure out a Roach Sisters song. Um, I don't know if you remember the Road Sisters, but yeah. the Hammond song was with the song that led me to like, wait a minute, this this I can't do this in standard tuning. This is too weird. I'm going to make a tuning that makes it sound so pretty, just like the Roach Sisters. And that was kind of the beginning of tunings and composing and sort of this new world of creating songs, almost like choreographing. So, that, you know, really I'm passionate for the complexity of lots of tension, lots of harmony, lots of counter. Mm. And that was the sort of beginning of be doing what I do now. Oh. I, I think there's uh, there's a lot of that in your music, especially the complex harmonies. You're, you're very much known for that, uh, for sort of these maybe unexpected changes if you're if you're thinking within the box of folk or pop music uh, were there any musicians early on that influenced you to sort of get beyond that that type of box well I, I mean obviously Joni Mitchell was was very inspiring um, Bonnie Raitt <laughs> Ricky Lee Jones Stevie Wonder was a mm -hmm. huge Shaka Khan fan just nice. like sang along with her forever and ever and ever the Beatles um, for just composition-wise, the Beatles, like, forever and ever. Um, yeah, and I just, I realized that, I was talking about this the other day with someone, like, the chord progressions that I choose are, they're not that unusual. They're, it, it, they just sound different because there's so many tension notes in most of the chords and the tunings that I've chosen. Um Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to think of it as like it, it's still pop music. It's still like really like one, four, five, you know, minor six back to one. But there's this rich sonority of like, oh, there's a flat five most of the time. And oh, there's, the, you know, a major seven or, a, you know, I'm just throwing in the kitchen sink as well, because that's what makes me tick. Wow. Definitely. Well, I wanted to let everybody know real quick, uh, we are watching the chat on YouTube and Facebook and everywhere. So um, if you have questions for Jonathan, we're, we're going to try and keep an eye on that. So 
Uh, keep the comments coming. We're watching. And uh, I guess back back to you, Rich. I'm sorry you're about to ask a question. Oh, I was actually about to ask one that uh, that Ruth Ann Greenberg, our friend, is asking in the chat right now. Uh, do you find the creative process to be uh, different when you're writing on guitar or piano? And which one's easier for you to compose on? Uh, wow, it's it's it is totally, totally different. Um, the piano is so foreign to me and still so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Merrick, um, that it's it's um, it's just kind of this searching for the sound and then memorizing it like choreography. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and it, it just, I write completely differently because this is just this weird black and white keyboard thing that, <laughs> that has its <laughs> own rules and its own pathway. And then the guitar is, I think a little more familiar, more comfortable to me. And often a new tuning will be what leads me down another compositional path. I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll get off a plane and the TSA will have messed with my guitar and it'll come out of the case with a, like some bizarre tuning and that, that will somehow create a new song for me. So uh, they are very different though. The guitar seems a little more straightforward. It's a more, to me, I, I tend to fall into more pop progressions on the guitar and then the the keyboard is just like wow we could just go anywhere because it everything is kind of chromatic and you could like chords can follow other chords that i wouldn't think of on the guitar right well i've mm. seen you bring all kinds of instruments including the kalimba into some of your music which um in your your play my mother has four noses uh, you, you, there's yeah. a song you played on kalimba and you've also used that uh in some other compositions so it's just great that you're always exploring different instrumentation. Yeah, I, when, when I do a fair amount of um, teaching these days, I do songwriting workshops, mostly in Nashville, uh, but that's one of the things that I talk about in, in teaching is sometimes if you're if you're stuck or you're hitting the wall or you just you need a new idea, just pick up an instrument that you're terrible at or pick up an instrument that you've never played before. And that, <laughs> that's that great. happened with, with me with the kalimba. And also I've been playing the mandolin a fair amount lately on the last oh. couple of records. And I'm terrible at the mandolin, but it's a whole different sonority. Um, it's you know, it's this weird different tuning thing. And I so I compose very differently with only those four notes and of course I tuned it I tuned the mandolin differently than normal tuning I tuned the lowest string down a half step because it's it's just sadder it just sounds better to me mm -hmm. and so I um that really inspires a, a very different I hear I hear things differently and I, so I'm not necessarily including the root of the chord in in all of the progressions on the mandolin and it opens up whole other worlds mm. And when you're writing music, do you find that the, the music comes first or the lyrics or a combination of those processes? If I'm lucky, the words will come first, but I'd say it's kind of 60, 40 words to music. Okay. Uh, but I, I often find, for me at least, being being an English major and being just devoted to good writing, fiction, short stories, poetry, uh, I find that the words, if I can hunker down and, and hone in on it, a hook or or a, or a verse or something the words tell me so much about how i will say them how i will sing them what word matters the most where the high note should go what the cadence should be so often mm. if i have a bunch of words i'll just i'll walk them out i'll go for a walk and i'll just sort of figure out okay is this a three four is this four four like how where what matters and and the, so for me the words are kind of the key into everything Wow. Amazing. Mike, I've been hogging the spotlight. You uh, <laughs> want to ask anything? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, let me see what I've got here. Well, you know what? I have to ask. You had the opportunity to work with somebody. In fact, it was through him that that we met, uh, which is Joe Sample. And I just wanted to ask a little bit about, you know, your working with him and getting to collaborate with him. Uh, he was an absolute sweetheart to us at Casio and yeah. introduced us. I, can, can, what was it like to work with him? Thank you, Joe. Right. Joe is the most amazing composer I've ever met. Besides being 
complex and rich in his voicings. No one voices chords the way Joe Sample does. He also just has such an ear for a hook and for a groove and no one just no one compares and uh so we wrote a couple songs together a bunch of records ago uh i forget the name of the record but we i wrote the lyrics and he wrote the music for a couple of songs and so we sort of got to know each other that way my husband also full disclosure managed joe for 35 40 years i think they were a team um and so Joe had this idea for a, a, a Broadway musical, and uh, he'd had gone through a couple of other lyricists that just it, it wasn't gelling, and they didn't know about Joe's history. They didn't they didn't have this like deep respect and reverence for him that that I do. And finally, um, he's like, "Well, why don't you wait? Why don't you do this?" So we started writing songs for this musical together, and we wrote twenty beautiful songs together um, before he passed away. And it's, it was just an honor. I mean, just such an amazing, amazing education and beautiful journey that we shared together. And the, the last song we wrote together is actually on his tombstone in Houston. It's called uh, True to You, and it's on my last record. I'm dropping a screenshot onto the broadcast. I pulled from your Instagram a picture Aww. of you in the, in the studio with, with Joe in the background that that was just a charming photo mm. Sweet. uh a couple of comments coming in uh our buddy mark is saying uh jonathan checking in from philly i first learned about you through wxpn uh many artists like yourself did a great job of getting exposure through many of these college stations would yep. you advise that up-and-coming artists still go that angle absolutely go whatever angle you can i mean it's not like we have a choice. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, if XBN plays you, you are golden. They've been so supportive to me over the years. The World Cafe sessions that I've done for them, yeah. uh, and and you know, it's a it's a real it's like a family there. You know, Michaela and Helen and Bruce and David Die. I mean, it really we all grew up together. Well, I certainly grew up with them, and um, you know, it's it's. If you can build those relationships and keep them over the years, uh, it, it's a really valuable thing to do. And you know, the other advice is like never burn a bridge. <laughs> That's good That's advice. advice. Yeah, no matter what you're doing. The right. very very small world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, sort of a follow up to that. Throughout your career, you've you've worked with labels, uh, MCA and Ryko Disc. Uh, Etc. And you, you're mostly well known for doing so much on your own. So how would you compare the experience of being under that kind of umbrella uh, versus forging your own path as you have? Well, I like to thank those major labels for my short stretches under their umbrellas because it is a ton of money that they have. And so I got to make four beautiful records with four beautiful budgets in four beautiful recording studios with, you know, the musicians of my choice and creative control. And uh, those are amazing, amazing times. And to have that kind of support, that kind of financial muscle behind you is such a gift. And it allowed me when I went independent to sort of capitalize on the, the work that we'd already done and that that fan base that I'd already built. And I think that without that, as much as, you know, it, it sucked to be dropped, you know, from major labels, but it, there's always a, you know, there's always a regime change and the next person coming in doesn't really care who the hell you are. So it's just par for the course. But uh, those were great years and great records and allowed me to really make a go of it as an independent. So since 99, I've been... I've been my own label. I've been Bad Dog Records. And uh, <laughs> so, okay, I don't have the deep pockets that Warner Brothers or MCA had, but I get to make all the decisions and it feels good to be the boss. <laughs> so you uh, recent, in, oh, sorry, no, go for it, Mike. W w you recently recorded music at Sweetwater, Sweetwater Sound in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I'm just wondering how that came about. Uh, I know they've had you as a guest for some of their... Um, songwriting workshops and things like that but mm -hmm. what was it like recording there and you know what what came out of that 
we were doing a recording workshop. Uh, Mark Hornsby, who was sort of the boss of the studio there at the time, uh, does these amazing recording workshops. So, you know, guitar gear recording geeks can come in and sort of see how they make the pancakes. So, you know, 15 <laughs> people are in the studio as I, you know, I'm, I'm the guinea pig that week, perhaps, um, record you know, the idea for this particular recording session was to s sort of see how to get a live feel. So my guitar player, Sean Driscoll, and I flew into Fort Wayne, and then we used their amazing house band, uh, Nick DiVirgilio, Dave Martin, and Phil Nash uh, to, to round out the band. And so we recorded these tracks live for this recording workshop. And then, you know, before we came down there, Mark was, Mark and I were sort of spitballing about what what songs we would do and he said well what why don't you come for a couple extra days and we'll just make a record you know we don't yeah. have to try to get 11 songs into the three-day workshop but come for a couple extra days and let's see what happens and we can choose songs from your entire career and and make a sort of retrospective but very live feeling but very beautifully recorded in a gorgeous studio kind <laughs> of uh, adventure and so that's what we did and it it turned out beautifully so it's coming out in may wow can't can't, can't wait. wait to hear it can't wait a great question coming in from youtube um if you could work with anyone or write a song with anyone collaborate with someone that you haven't worked with yet who would that be you know it would be fun to write a song with john mayer ah all right and it's like sing a duet or something but he already did that he already did that duet with Katy perry so like bummer <laughs> <laughs> doesn't mean it can't happen again yeah well I, I i have always thought about wouldn't it be it would be fun to write a whole album of duets and like choose choose different singers to like Okay, Brandy Carlisle, let's do a duet. Okay, John Mayer, let's do a duet. Okay, Bonnie Raitt, let's let's have some fun and just write songs specifically for those particular voices and see what happened. I think you need to make that happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're watching right now, so we'll make sure they reach out to you afterwards. <laughs> Um, here's a, here's a random one for you. In uh, in 2001, I think it was, you uh, had a song on David Letterman, and you absolutely killed it. By the way, it was really great. Um, <laughs> what was that like at that point in your career? That was pretty great. Um, actually, somebody was asking me the other day, like, do you still have those red leather pants? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and, and the Starsky and Hutch shirt, by the way. I still have the Starsky and Hutch shirt. That's like a treasure, and I, I, you know, I can't even wash it because it's almost turning into dust. But um, that was amazing, and it, it was most satisfying because it was I had already gone independent at that point, so I put out yeah. Steady Pull, which was the first studio record I did on my own label, and we were able to take Linger the song, you know the song on Steady Pull, it was top five in AAA radio. And we got on the Letterman show, we got on the Conan show, we got on Craig Kilborn. And so all these major labels that, you know, had sort of, you know, written me off were like calling me and Pat, because it was just me and Pat, my husband, <laughs> uh, making the calls and trying to get onto these shows and these radio stations. They were calling us to ask how we'd done it. We were like, well, <laughs> make a good record. <laughs> make a good song right, and then right. you know i think actually david letterman listened to wxpn and i oh, think that was wow. part of why oh. sheila his booking person who we knew was like hey what about jonathan and dave's like well yeah i've heard her on xpn like why not and that you know i love that song so but the pants ugh. <laughs> <laughs> they were the stars of the show <laughs> it's it's funny on that in the song linger there's there's a lyric i'm captive in your presence that probably has a lot of new relevance to people that are stuck at home right now oh and, my uh, god <laughs> so i just wanted to ask you know we're all dealing with similar kind of things how how is it being uh stuck at home with with someone you love to use your line from your videos <laughs> <laughs> well luckily i am stuck at home with someone i love and we're good at this that's great 
we are often working from home, both of us, um, never for this long of a period. And I love touring so much and it's breaking my heart not to be able to be out there, you know, with people and in that electricity that happens in a room with people gathering. Um, but we're, we're doing okay. Um, the scariest part is <laughs> my husband obviously is in the music business too. So there's, we're, that we don't have jobs. Like we, there's nothing coming in. Oh, <laughs> so the we're just gone. kind of juggling and trying to figure it out and hoping that, you know, somehow we will slowly get back to being able to gather and make live music. And, uh, it is amazing as much as the internet can be overwhelming. It's amazing what it's allowing us touring musicians to do from home now. And it's, literally keeping me afloat and so i just i'm so grateful if any of you out there have been contributing i am so very grateful oh yeah you are allowing this new record to be made and paid for and i i thank you 10 gazillion million hearts because awesome. <laughs> i mean is this, this is a kick your new album is a is a kickstarter campaign is that correct no or it's just oh. um if you want to come to my kitchen concerts on mondays at two you can <laughs> You can throw some money in a pot of my my bad dog uh, PayPal account. Awesome. That's it. It's sort of oh, like great. you know, suggested ticket price. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and people can see those on your uh, on your Facebook page or Instagram. What's the best yeah. way to yeah. keep? Yeah, up? for now I'm sort of a tech um, fail. So it's Facebook Live Mondays at two Central Time in my kitchen. And we leave the concerts up for a week and then we take them down so that you have to come back for the next one. And we try. <laughs> so far, I'm not repeating any songs. So you won't get well, more. And so far, the video and audio quality is actually really good. So I wouldn't I wouldn't call you a tech fail at all. These are great oh, videos. Oh, you're very, very kind. I, the first week I tried using the laptop camera and a little microphone. The second week I tried my iPhone because I think the video is better, but... The jury's still out on the audio, audio, and there's also that delay that happens, which is hard when you're trying to, you know, to right. sort of warm for your kitchen. <laughs> it's hard to be seeing yourself three seconds delayed and know what's actually happening. Right. So. Well, we've we've learned a few things, and I know you and I will and be talking, you know what I'm talking about, afterward right? to try and <laughs> see if we can't uh, help you get the the quality to the next level. But they're great already, and you know it's great to interact with your fans online this way. So, uh, I mean, I was watching just last week, and I was like, oh my gosh, we got to get you on here. So, yay! Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Speaking of well, which, and I have to tell a story oh, about you, Mike. Actually, oh, because. No. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, I just have to th to thank you, and and Casio has been oh. supporting me for years now. And every time we've done, my mother has four noses, all over the country. We've done it in Cleveland now. We've done it in Philly. We've done it in Arkansas. Uh, we've done it in Minneapolis. Um, Mike and Casio have uh, provided me with the keyboard that is the keyboard of the show, and it's pretty amazing um, that kind of support. And and even like last minute. Things like I'll be in Paris and I'll be like, oh, I forgot to call you in advance. Like, any chance you could give me like a keyboard like now? <laughs> and he will jump through hoops and make it happen. Yeah. So I have to, I have to give you like yeah. huge, huge credit and thanks. We're we're a family here at Casio, and one of the things we've always tried to do is you know do our best to support artists that are supporting us. And so it's the very least we can do. We've had some situations with you know the current. Corona situation where the artists oh. are stranded in places where they don't have access to the instruments they had been touring with, and so right. we, you know we've had to to make some arrangements. Uh, Tom Brislin, who's out with Kansas, as an example, is is home with his parents right now. But we got him a privy, oh. and now he's he's writing music, so he's being, cool. being being productive. But you know, um, you know, it all started with Joe. So you know, hats Sample. off to him. So yeah. sample. And Paul and Paul Mitchell, by the way, and that's how that all happened. Uh, I just I mean, quick very quick story from from my side, but that all happened. Cassio's introduction to Joe Sample was because Paul and I ended up sitting next to each other on a plane. It, oh, no. it, it was completely 
random. And, That's awesome. um, and Paul Mitchell is a great sound engineer. Um, cheers, Paul, if you're, if you're watching. Great sound engineer who uh, came comes out to all your shows and, and helps you. Um, but he was touring with Joe at the time, and, and he he invited me to come and meet Joe and, and try, in fact, the instrument that you have right there, the PX350. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, basically, I was told by Paul that Joe wouldn't play digital pianos anymore uh, because mm -hmm. he was really uncomfortable with the way the action felt. And in fact, with some keyboards had, you know, some arm and wrist pain and things like that. So he said, no, I'm never going to play a digital piano ever again. And I said, but will, will you try one? Uh, because we were certainly very confident in the in the quality of the action. He said, of course, he'll try it. And I remember being in a hotel room in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, and Joe was playing the PX350, and Paul grabbed me and said, why aren't you recording this? And I said, well, you know, I didn't want to impose. He says, he hasn't stopped playing yet. You have to. <laughs> and You sound like Paul. <laughs> <laughs> he was grabbing me. He was so excited because, you know, reliability of, of instruments and something that's lightweight yeah. and, you know, the Privia was a great solution for him. It is so, amazing. Like, the feel is amazing. So, anyway, I apologize for my little story, but that's eventually how we met was through Paul Mitchell and your husband. So anyway, <laughs> that's great stuff. So there's happy to have you a so many family. nice and there's so many nice compliments coming in. Uh, a huge fan. Um, uh, yeah. Lots of people coming in and saying that they're, that they're really enjoying you. Um, here's a question. Did she ever take up a 12 string guitar? Oh, yes. Oh, Joan Armatrading. Oh, I had an, I had a 12 string, uh, right after college, I bought a Martin 12 string and it, it didn't have a truss rod and it kicked my ass. <laughs> it was so hard to play. And I have, I have small hands anyway, and, and it was just brutal. And then of course, keeping it in tune was a whole other thing with open tuning. So I, I oh. think I used it on maybe one or two records, you know, as a sort of overdub part, but I ended up trading it for Duke Levine's leather jacket. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have the jacket? No, and I wish I did. It was way too big for me, but I just was way more into the leather jacket than the 12-string guitar. <laughs> Uh, here's another one right. from Ruth. Was it difficult transitioning from being in the story to being a solo act? Yes, it was really scary at the time. Uh, and I'd been singing with Jennifer for a number of years. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, it was really like starting all over again and trying to figure out like, well, am I enough? You know, is, is my sort of singular version of things enough? And what can I take from from how I'm hearing things now, but also sort of honor the past and still come up with these cool harmonies and counterpoints and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was really, really scary. Yeah, it was hard. And then, and then I embraced it. It was really a, a you know, making plum was the first record after the, the angel in the house um, was such an amazing experience and sort of slowly gathering confidence and, um, trusting my own ears and my own instincts as a co-producer and uh, trusting my ideas for like, okay, how much is too much of mm -hmm. the old thing? What's the right sound for now? What, like, who am I? And um, that was Plum. Wow. Well, your story is inspirational to independent musicians who, if <laughs> they, they follow your timeline, you know, especially considering the state of the industry now, it's, it's musicians are really charged with building their own brand and doing their own thing and all they need to do for a great example is is yeah. look to your work oh that's <laughs> that's very stuff. sweet there's no question there i just wanted to you know compliment <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's hard i mean there my husband and i talk about it all the time especially in the early days of of going independent you really have to have very deep heart-to-heart -heart talks with yourself about what constitutes success like what's enough Where's the bar now? Okay, like I probably, as you know, mom and pop bad dog records, probably not going to sell a couple million records, especially now because 
no one's buying records anymore. It's it's all streaming. But back in back in the day, it was like each time you made a new record, you had to recalibrate because sales were changing and the internet was coming on and you had to just sort of put your head down and be like, all right, wait, I would be doing this no matter what. So how are we going to make it work? What's going to make it okay for me in the pit of my belly? Like how will I sleep at night and know that I'm still doing what I have to do and I can still keep myself alive doing it. Um, mm. And so far so good, but it's, it, it's definitely a, it's a heart to heart you have to have with yourself all the time. Is that is that a constant struggle? Yeah, it is. Um, I wanted to ask. I, I know you're a, a big fan of uh, Woody Guthrie, <laughs> and um, I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what what it is about his music or, or the man himself that really that really speaks to you and influences you. Well, I made a record with his lyrics and my music. A record called The Works back yeah. in 2008. And I have to say, I was, I, I knew sort of the songs that everyone knew, knows, but, but I was invited into the archives to, to look a little further and to, to make a complete record. And I think it was the first chick that was sort of invited into the fold. And I fell in love with his, his energy, his unbridled, fearless, creativity like this is a guy that d did not second guess himself he wasn't you know i don't really sense an i suck knob in his palette <laughs> he just was writing and playing and working and trying stuff and painting and walking and traveling and uh, politicizing and uh, it was such a great example of stop being so damn precious about yourself and just do the work, you know, just get to work, just whatever it is. Like don't edit it before you even tried it, you know, just do it. And mm -hmm. uh, I have to still remind myself of that uh, even now because it, it was such an amazing project. It felt effortless because I felt like he was in the room with me sort of saying, that's good, let's, let's go, let's go, let's, that's, yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> And it, it really just felt like this buoyant, fun excursion. And I was able to, luckily his daughter, Nora, who is the gatekeeper of his archives, uh, was, was really generous with all of the stuff that was in there. And she let me pour through everything. And she let me take a couplet from, you know, a journal from 1946 and put it with a tattered piece of scribbled legal paper from 20 years later. And she, she let me cut and paste these beautiful little gems that I would find that, you know, were sort of isolated in other stuff that didn't maybe make a song, but she would let me call these items and then create a, a narrative out of um, really disparate things. And it was, it was such a, her confidence was a huge gift. Oh, wow. That must've been an amazing experience. It was pretty cool. The record, you know, Joe Sample is on the record. Joe Sample and Christian McBride, Greg Lease, uh, Steve Gadd. I mean, it did not suck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think a lot of us need a need a Woody Guthrie on our shoulder to uh, to know when to stop editing. That's that's some deep wisdom right there. It really it really is, and and just even even in you know people who are recording artists who are are maybe younger and and just beginning to record and make records uh, in the old days we had to we just had to do it in a take you know mm -hmm. and you didn't have you couldn't just cut and paste by syllable you couldn't comp a vocal and tune every single word it was like no you know you had to have your shit together mm -hmm. and um, i think that that's another thing that sort of feels like is getting lost and I am trying to hang on to it as much as I can. It's up, it's too easy now to cut, paste, bit, piece, um, fly, whatever. And so part of what we were trying to do this last November and at the Sweetwater sessions is be as honest as we could. Yes, of course, we fixed some things and you know, stuff that didn't line up, we would maybe tweak it, but for the most part, we were really trying to get at live performances and what that feels like, you know, mm -hmm. musicians playing in a room at the same time. That's fantastic. Wow. I have to ask um, about a particular song. Um, 
goes back to the Peter Pan movie Return to Neverland. I would love to know <laughs> how how did that all come about? Well, I had just I was living in Los Angeles. I think I had just gone independent. I met this woman named Bambi at an industry <laughs> dinner. This is a true that's, story. That's amazing. <laughs> we became friends. We still we're still buddies. Turns out she worked at Disney. <laughs> and she was working on this new Peter Pan movie. It was going to be this big deal because it was no one had ever made a sequel to Peter Pan, the original animated movie. So this was uh, the sequel to Peter Pan. Peter Pan 2, Return to Neverland. And they needed a big song. They needed a song that would detail the travails of their new protagonist, 12-year-old Jane, who is Wendy, the original Peter Pan, you know, protagonist, um, it's her daughter. And now it's wartime London. And so this little girl, Jane, has to basically do all the stuff that Wendy did in the first version, but she's Jane and she has to come to it on her own. So she has to like, save Peter a million times, keep Tinkerbell's light from going out. She has to believe in faith and trust in pixie dust and find the lost boys, you know, all the stuff. <laughs> and, and she has to like do it in a two minute song. <laughs> <laughs> Bambi called me and said, I need you to do this sort of emotional journey of a 12 year old girl. And I said, I'm, I'm your girl. I got this. I got this. Oh, my so goodness. that's my specialty. So I wrote this song called I'll Try. Would you be so kind to play that for us? I just, I adore the song. I, my my son <clears throat> was just a wee little guy when this movie came out. So this movie got played a lot back when the age of VCRs and DVDs. And, and I saw, I did see you last week on Facebook right here in your kitchen playing this song. And I said, oh, it's just my favorite. <laughs> oh, that's wicked sweet. Yeah, it's um, and it's all over the world now. It's just, that's what's so exciting. I'll, I'll you know I'll be touring in Denmark, and all the little Danish kids will come with their mothers, and they they know it, it but they know it in Danish. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give it a shot. Thank you. I think so. 
stories The whole world is made of faith And trust And pixie dust So I'll try Cause I finally believe I'll try If you could hear the entire internet clapping right now, <laughs> instead of just Rich and I. I try to imagine uh, it because it is it is a whole new experience performing for a kitchen counter and, right. you know, a, a, a two-dimensional screen. But it's, um, I can feel, you know, I sort of feel it. It feels like, it feels good. <laughs> that was so beautiful. beautiful. Thank you very, Absolutely very much. Thank song. you. How did the Casio sound in my kitchen? It's- Sounds great. Sounded pretty good. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that with us. There's, your, your music has a powerful effect on a lot of people. In fact, there's, there's a comment here um, from James who says, Inconsolable helped me get through the loss of my wife, Janet. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, James. Yeah, that's very sorry for the loss of your wife. James, but thank you very much for for chiming in. Lots of uh, lots of people saying beautiful. There's some <laughs> clapping on the uh, emojis on the chat here. <laughs> clapping emojis. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Super sweet. Uh, here's a question. I might reword it a tiny bit. Uh, some singers have a vocal quirk. Don't know what it's called, but some have it like with bending notes. What do, do you feel like your voice has a vocal signature? Something. Uh, a specific quality of your voice that uh, that is unique. <laughs> well, much that's like a tough my, one to try and reword. <laughs> what, yeah, I, I sort of I think I get the question. I think that um, ideally, I mean, we're all products of our own strengths and limitations, and it's the same with my guitar playing. It came about because of my own limitation of the, of the fact that I, you know, reading music was just not going to happen for me. So I started just making stuff up on the tunings as well. And, and the way I play the piano mm-hmm. and kind of same with my voice, I'm not a trained singer at all. So I'm at the mercy of my own limitations. So I, I sing the way I sing because I don't know how to sing any other way. <laughs> and so I never learned how to smooth out, the break in my voice from the high high notes to the low notes. So there's a place in the middle that's intense for me. It's 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 um it's uh at the top of my sort of chest range. It feels like a very intense part of how I sing and over the years I it's become sort of a way of amplifying whatever I'm saying in the song. So if I if there's something that I really want to have an urgency or an intensity, you know, obviously I will, I will sort of plan the melody to be kind of at that top of my range. And then if there's something more plaintive that happens that needs to have more pathos to it, it, it often will happen like with inconsolable, right. you know, mm. um, there's, there's that sort of switch from, cause you were the one sure. So it's a switch from those, like the stronger chest voice to like the plaintive, like you were the one sure thing. Yeah. It's a very wide dynamic range. But you're using, yeah, but you're using what you consider your limitations of your voice yeah. to bring the song to another level, and that's just brilliant. Yeah, and I think that I mean, when I'm when I'm teaching, I talk about this a lot too about that sort of sometimes your your the things that you think are your limitations that are your worst. You're like, oh, I'm sort of squeamish about that. Um, those can be your absolute signature qualities. Those can be the absolute thing that identifies you as you. And um, there's only one of you, uh, you know, 
I, I quote Martha Graham a lot in my workshops, but there's only one of you in all of time. And if you don't do what you're supposed to do, then the world won't have your particular uniqueness. The world will have lost it. So, you know, do what you do, oh, <laughs> the way you do. Beautiful. It. That's incredible advice. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to thank you. We're, rep- we're almost here at, at, at an hour. We're just watching the chat here for a few more comments or questions before we wrap up. But just wanted to thank you so much for spending this hour with us and sharing your music and, 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 you know, letting us ask a few questions. We're, we're all such fans of yours. So it's, it's just outstanding to spend this time with you. <laughs> That's wicked sweet. Oh, and, and you can tell James that um, I, I'm planning on singing Inconsolable next Monday on my kitchen concert. So excellent. I'll That's put great. it in the set list. And that'll be on Facebook. <laughs> Correct. And at what time? Mondays at 2 p.m. Central. All right. I'm going to just type that here and get it at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, mm-hmm. on my Facebook page because I don't really know how to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We will get this in the broadcast here. Thank you. At the bottom of the screen for a couple minutes. In a bright color. We well, go. it's great to it's great to see and hear that you're being musical while while we're all stuck at home. Uh, you know, I I know some of us have challenges with that, but you know, yeah. hearing you doing your stuff is definitely inspiring to those of us who need a little kick to get into high gear with our own creativity. Well, thank you. Yeah, I really recommend picking up an instrument if you have one lying around that you've never played before, because it'll be amazing what you come up with. <laughs> well, that's such great advice. I have a mandolin right here, but I'm still afraid of it. I'm oh, too afraid okay. to pick it up. Tune the bottom string down a half step and see what happens. Okay. I'll give it a shot. That would require me tuning all of the strings because I probably haven't touched that guy in a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure there's a video somewhere about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jonathan. Well, thank you. Thank you again so much for spending this hour with us. This is uh, a great honor to have you here today and um, sharing your music with us. We will be tuning in along with everybody else Monday, 2 p.m. Central uh, on your Facebook page. We can't wait to see you and listen to you play that song. Thank so Thank you so much. I really awesome. appreciate the time. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. This has been great. All right. And from Casio, this is Mike Martin and Rich Formadoni. We will see you on our next Artist Spotlight, which will be tomorrow, same time, same place here on Facebook, YouTube, wherever you happen to be watching Casio Music Gear. Tomorrow uh, will be same time, Central, 2 p.m., 3 p.m. Eastern, April 9th. Our guest will be Mr. Larry Den of Earth, Wind & Fire, so we hope to see you there. Goodbye for now. Take care. Bye. Thanks.